Hi everyone, this is Jyotsna Hegde with NRI Pulse. Joining us today is Dr. Anant Madhabushi, who serves as Executive Director for the Emory Empathetic AI for Health Institute. Dr. Madhabushi holds a primary faculty appointment in the Department of Biomedical Engineering and secondary appointments in the Departments of Radiology and Imaging Services, Biomedical Informatics, and Pathology. Prior to joining Emory, Dr. Madhabushi was at Case Western Reserve University, where he was the director of the Center of Computational Imaging and Personalized Diagnostics and Donnell Institute Professor, Department of Biomedical Engineering. He was also a research health scientist at the Louis Stokes Cleveland Veterans Administration Medical Center. Dr. Madhabushi has authored more than 450 peer-reviewed publications and holds more than 100 patents either issued or pending in the areas of artificial intelligence, radiomics, computational pathology, medical image analysis, and computer vision. His team has been applying these approaches for diagnosis, prognosis, and prediction of treatment response across a spectrum of disease, including different types of cancers, cardiovascular disease, kidney disease, and ophthalmology. There are many more credits, accolades, and recognitions to Dr. Madhabushi, and if I continue to list them, it would probably fill up my half hour. So instead, let's welcome Dr. Madhabushi and learn more about his very important work. The Emory Empathetic. We recently launched the Emory Empathetic uh, AI for Health Institute, and really our focus and our mission within the institute is really on developing, innovating, novel advances in AI technology, specifically around health and medicine. But we are not going to stop just there. We're also going to walk the talk. What I mean by that is working with our partners in Emory Healthcare, we're then going to deploy this technology locally within the healthcare enterprise and set the stage for ultimately deploying and scaling this to technologies, uh, to, to countries all over the world, including my own native country of India, uh, which is where I grew up. So uh, that's, I think, really the promise of uh, artificial intelligence, the ability to mine through large amounts of data and to find subtle cues, subtle patterns that relate to uh, disease diagnostics that allow for better detection, early detection, better characterization, and to do this in a way that uh, is potentially more robust and resilient compared to human interpretation. I mean, we know that humans are great in rendering diagnosis, both on radiology as well as on pathology uh, images. The problem is that humans tend to tire. Uh, there is a lot of variability between interpretations across different humans. And so the ability to have uh, AI algorithms that can read in a more consistent manner will allow for more uh, reproducible, robust decision support. We're not trying to replace the physician. We're trying to provide them with the tools that would allow them to do their job even better. But beyond that, I think the other promise for artificial intelligence beyond disease diagnosis is being able to identify the aggressiveness of the disease, right? So the fact is that in the United States, for instance, something like 40% of the adult population will be identified or diagnosed with some form of cancer in their lifetime. And we don't necessarily need to treat every cancer because a lot of the cancers that are diagnosed are actually fairly indolent. They are not very aggressive. And the big promise for AI is how we can start to use these tools with routine radiology, routine pathology to allow for better characterization. In other words, identifying those patients who could benefit from just a watchful waiting approach. In other words, no intervention, but we're just waiting and watching to see what happens versus those patients who have far more aggressive disease and therefore need intervention right away. Those patients who need chemotherapy, for instance, um, and, you know, Jyotsna, you know, my uh, entry into the world of artificial intelligence and medicine is uh, comes from a very personal place, right? I grew up in India. I lost my aunt uh, to breast cancer in India. One of the things that I've been very acutely tuned to is how can we leverage the power of technologies like this to have an impact, particularly in low middle income countries like India, where you don't have 
access or a large number of patients don't have access to more expensive, sophisticated technologies. And that's really the big opportunity that I see that with artificial intelligence, with uh, leveraging it with the use of routinely acquired data like radiology and pathology, we can now start to do so much more. We can basically predict which patients are going to be able to uh, predict, uh, we we're able to predict which patients are going to benefit uh, from uh, certain treatments, which patients are um, have more aggressive versus less aggressive disease, uh, and therefore really move uh, precision medicine forward. Yeah, that's um, actually what I was going to ask you. So, um, you know, this particular research that you have uh, in artificial intelligence, so in layman's terms, can you kind of give us an example and sort of uh, in the context of health, what does it mean for a layman, you know, research, especially in the context of health? Um, so the questions are a few, uh, right? So, you know, we, we all know that diagnostics is key, that we need to be able to identify the presence or absence of disease earlier. And in that context, the use of AI with routine data to be mm -hmm. able to identify which patients have the disease or which patients don't have the disease is really critical, right? So that is one application of these technologies. But there is um, additional uh, opportunities, which I mentioned in the context of disease prognosis in predicting treatment response and treatment benefit that are really huge. Uh, we um, know that a lot of uh, our patients will develop diseases like cancer, will develop um, other uh, chronic conditions. And I think that's the opportunity where we can use the power of AI to figure out what kind of treatment strategy, what kind of treatment regimen do we want to uh, put these patients down on. Right. You know, coming back and uh, connecting it back to low middle income countries like India, you know, we have changed, we've seen a, a, a sea change mm -hmm. in the uh, kind of drugs and the kind of therapeutics and interventions that we have at our disposal now, right? So if you take... Uh, immunotherapy. Immunotherapy has changed the landscape of how we treat cancer patients today. The problem is that these drugs are very expensive. They cost somewhere in the order of a quarter of a million dollars per patient per year, putting it well beyond the reach of most patients in India. But the other piece is that most patients actually don't respond to immunotherapy. They don't respond to these drugs. And so how can we leverage the power of AI to tell us in advance as to which patients are going to respond to these drugs, which patients are not going to respond to these drugs, and therefore really identify the appropriate treatment regimen for these patients so that we can really uh, develop the right strategies and the right protocols for these patients. So there's the diagnostic piece, mm -hmm. but then the ability to identify the appropriate treatment protocols and management strategies for these patients, I think is a big, huge opportunity in, in this sort of area of precision medicine. You know, um, uh, Dr. Madhubush, I um, actually lost my mother to cancer, and but she survived for eight years. Um, she was diagnosed in Bangalore, India, and but she lived for eight years. But, you know, she didn't, uh, ultimately, she didn't die of cancer. She, I think she died because of over-treatment, because the radiation that they gave her, um, they were not able to do surgery, so they gave her radiation. Um, it was the, uh, you know, a carcinoma of the upper um, trichoid area in the uh, esophagus. So, um, but, you know, the treatment that they gave her for her stage, they said was radiation. And I think they gave her 70 gray of radiation. And pretty much it was downfall after that because she could never really eat. And for the eight years that she lived, it was all peg feed. So um, in that context is, um, and I was looking up your research and you, you talked about how, you know, even though you put patients in different categories, uh, yet they might not all respond in the same ways that, uh, you know, the other patients that that's expected to. So in that context, how is it that AI can, uh, you know, sort of um, jump in and uh, is that some area where uh, also uh, AI can help? In fact, Jotsan, I think you just really nailed it. I mean, that is literally exactly the potential for these technologies, right? So this issue of over-treatment, uh, you know, you talked about your mother being exposed to unnecessary radiation. I'll give you a, a very, very similar example. You know, just prior to breast cancer, you have something called DCIS or ductal carcinoma in situ, which is often referred to as stage zero breast cancer or pre-malignant breast cancer. 
And with the DCIS, very often um, these women will um, get surgery, right? And surgery is the uh, is the first intervention. But the question then is which of these women will also benefit from radiation therapy over and above surgery, right? And the truth is that only a subset of women will actually benefit, but we don't have a good way of figuring that out. And now our data is showing. Uh, with the AI, we're able to look at biopsies of the DCIS and predict which women are going to receive that added benefit from radiation therapy versus those women who can avoid the radiation therapy and will benefit from surgery alone. Uh, we actually have put some data out last year uh, showing this also to be true in the context of head and neck cancer, where with head and neck cancer, we know that a lot of uh, patients will get radiation therapy, but we were able to identify those patients where if you had reduced the radiation dose, uh, it would have actually been uh, perfectly fine. You could have de-escalated, safely de-escalated radiation treatment in, um, in a subset of patients uh, based off the features of the patterns that the AI was identifying. So I think there are huge, tremendous opportunities for de-intensification, de-escalation, prevention of over-treatment. Um, but we need to figure out you know, the right opportunities and the right application areas uh, identify the right cohorts. The other piece I'll say, Jotsna, is you know our our research in our group has also identified that there are differences across populations. You know, this is not something that we hear about a lot yeah. with regard to AI. But you know, given um, you know, as you can tell, you know, I, I um, uh, grew up in India, um, and because of that, uh, I I think uh, deeply about whether the AI tools that we're developing are really going to work across different populations. And what our algorithms um, are already revealing is that there are subtle differences in the appearance of the disease across different populations. In fact, uh, we put out some data a couple of years ago showing breast cancer is slightly different between South Asians uh, like you and me versus a um, uh, North, uh, North American uh, population of European ancestry or even African-American ancestry. So there are subtle differences and we have to account for these differences and create more tailored more precise, more accurate population-specific uh, models. And that's exactly what we are trying to do right now. So as we talk about over-diagnosis and over-treatment, we have to think about affordability, we have to think about accessibility, and we have to think about equity. We have to make sure that these yeah. tools are really working across diverse patient populations. Absolutely. So how can AI sort of, uh, you know, make it affordable uh, and accessible healthcare solutions and maybe, you know, drugs, vaccines, diagnostics? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And one of the things that uh, we've been very focused on within our group is leveraging the power of AI with routine data. So looking at um, routine biopsy images, routine radiology images. And the truth is, if you take diseases like cancer, patients are going to have this data routinely acquired. They are going to have the radiology scans. They're going to have the pathology images that are routinely acquired for these patients. And with that data that is being routinely acquired, we can now bring the power of AI to start to interrogate the radiology and the pathology images. And by leveraging the power of these radiology pathology images, we are now able to find patterns and features that can identify who is going to benefit from the more aggressive treatments and who is not going to uh, benefit from the aggressive treatments. Uh, but the beauty is that because we are using routine data, there is no additional cost. I mean, there's not a lot of additional cost, right? Uh, so from a cost of goods sold perspective, you know, this is not like a molecular lab where you have to go and do some expensive gene expression profiling or developing a, a, a molecular diagnostic test. Because the data is being routinely acquired as part of the clinical workup for patients, we can leverage that data with the AI and uh, be able to predict outcomes for these patients. Uh, one of the examples that I gave in a recent talk uh, that I did was to talk about uh, breast cancer, the, the same disease that killed my aunt. And uh, with that disease, uh, what we have found is that most women, if it's diagnosed early, that most women can actually avoid the chemotherapy. They don't need the chemotherapy. Oh, wow. But the only way of really being able to identify that is with a molecular-based test, a genomic-based test, one that involves destructive testing of the tumor tissue and looks at the expression of different genes. Few problems with this test. One is that it 
like I said, it involves destructive testing of the tissue. But B, it involves the shipping of the tissue to a specialized lab in Redwood, California, where it's performed. And it's a $4,000 test, mm -hmm. right? What we have shown very recently in a publication is that when you use AI with biopsy images, we can come up with predictions that are potentially even better than what you're getting with this $4,000 test. Mm -hmm. And essentially, you're doing it for pennies on the dollar because we're not acquiring anything outside the clinical workup. We're just talking about an image of a biopsy. Every patient will have, every cancer mm -hmm. patient is going to have a biopsy. So if you digitize it with a slide scanner, which can be done for maybe a couple of dollars, you can then leverage the power of AI to do the interpretation and make this prediction. And Jyotsana, the other thing that is really important to understand is, you know, the context, right? I go back to India, I go back to the country I was, uh, you know, mm -hmm. raised, born and raised in, uh, where the cost of chemotherapy is about $1,900. Yeah. Now, how do you justify a test that costs $4,000 to tell you whether mm -hmm. or not you need chemotherapy when the cost yeah. of that drug is half the cost of the test that tells you whether or not you need it? So that's <laughs> where having tests that are really affordable, particularly for low middle income countries, becomes so important because we have to think about affordability. We have to think about accessibility. And like I said, you have to think about equity. Yeah. Now, Emory has, you know, established these key AI initiatives, right, uh, including the AI uh, in health centers. So uh, what's Emory's vision on this? Uh, so the, uh, the the vision that we are standing up in um, in Emory is to create the Emory Empathetic AI for Health Institute. And the vision for the Emory Empathetic AI for Health Institute is uh, a trifecta mission. We want to develop tools that are going to be affordable, accessible, and equitable. At the same time, we want to focus on innovation. We want to focus on deployment. We want to focus on scaling and translation. And the goal here is that we want to leverage the power of artificial intelligence and machine learning and use it with routinely acquired data, uh, with um, radiology, pathology, and really bring precision medicine in an affordable, equitable way to patients all over the globe. And I think at Emory, we have an opportunity to really lead the charge in this space because as a unified system where we have a top class university, along with a, a amazing healthcare enterprise, we have the opportunity not just to do the innovation, but then also to be uh, translating uh, the uh, projects uh, into clinical deployment, you know, so that's one of the things that we're already doing as part of the Institute is to take the innovations from the research realm and actually start to deploy it and put it into practice uh, within the clinical workflow. So that's something that we are very um, actively working on. Uh, the other piece that I'll also say about uh, Emory is the fact that, uh, you know, thanks to Provost uh, Balam Konda, there has been a, a focus over the last two years to really transform Emory into the hub for AI. And it's under the broad vision, a broad umbrella of AI humanity, where we are really seeing the opportunity for impact with AI across multiple different streams, right? Across the social sciences, across humanity, across law, uh, multiple different disciplines. The Emory Empathetic AI for Health Institute falls under this umbrella of AI humanities, but with a focus on health, with a focus on medicine. And the mantra, like I said, that we will continue to push within the Institute is around affordability, accessibility, and equity so that we can deliver the promise of affordable, accessible, equitable precision medicine uh, to everyone, not just in Georgia, but ultimately all over the world. Um, Dr. Madhubushi, as we've been talking about, you know, India and U.S., uh, AI has actually been uh, like a key area of partnership between, you know, India and the U.S., right? So what efforts are, you know, ongoing under this umbrella? Maybe you can specifically even talk about, uh, you know, from your lab in regards to the India partnership. Yeah, thank you so much. So, uh, like I've said a few times before, uh, Growing up in India, and I consider myself a Bombaywala. <laughs> I grew up in Bombay. And one of the things that was very important to me was to be able to create the collaborations and create the partnerships with India, because I did want to take these technologies and really have an impact in India. And it's taken several years, but I'm very happy to report that our work is starting to pay off. Uh, one of the 
uh, really important collaborations we struck up about five years ago, uh, five or six years ago, was with Dr. Sangeeta Desai and Dr. Vani Parmar, both uh, at the Tara uh, Memorial Cancer Center in Mumbai. And uh, we started to work with them on using AI to develop uh, low-cost uh, diagnostics for breast cancer. And uh, that technology uh, has now been funded firstly through a U.S. indoor joint grant, uh, but it has more recently been also funded through the National Cancer Institute, where we are uh, developing these technologies for uh, uh, cancer diagnostics in the context of breast, oral, and prostate cancer. And uh, this is a partnership uh, with uh, the Tata Cancer Center. Separately, we also have a, another large uh, grant that has been awarded through the National Cancer Institute, also working with the Tata Cancer Center uh, in the area of uh, oropharyngeal cancers or head and neck cancers, mm -hmm. uh, which as you know, is, is a major uh, epidemic in India. And so we are working with pathologists and radiation oncologists at the Tata Cancer Center uh, to be able to develop and deploy uh, these technologies for the benefit of patients in India. And then finally, I'll also mention uh, what I'm very excited about is branching outside just cancer and looking at other areas. Uh, and uh, we're very fortunate to be working with the LV Prasad uh, Medical Center in uh, Hyderabad, where we're applying these technologies in the context of uh, diabetes. Uh, so we're looking at diabetic uh, conditions of the eye, uh, looking develop AI for imaging, for pathology, for genomics, et cetera, et cetera. And the thing that I think about is what is the, uh, go back to what I said, you know, what, how can you develop technology that works across um, the most common uh, streams of data? How can we develop uh, AI that works with uh, radiology, with pathology, different kinds of data so that we can start to find patterns that tell us about uh, risk, that tells us about outcome, that tells us about treatment response. So I think that's really critical, really important um, a consideration here. And then um, secondly, we have to uh, be working with implementation scientists, right? This AI piece is wonderful, but at the end of the day, unless we're able to take the AI and bring it widely to the community, it is not going to have an impact. So one of the things we're doing within the Institute is working with implementation scientists, people who really understand implementation, uh, who are able to uh, really uh, take the technology and the innovation that we're doing, but be able to deploy it uh, in a widespread way. And so one of the things that we're already talking to and working with are uh, folks in India who can help us in that regard. Uh, I was recently in Mumbai for the Indian Cancer Congress and met a number of people there, and we're starting a number of conversations not just on the research, but really thinking about that next step about implementation and deployment. So um, I know our time's running out. So let me wrap up with, um, you know, what is like how, where, the future of uh, AI? What are the challenges? And uh, well, you talked about the benefits. So let's talk about the challenges. Yeah, so, uh, you know, Joksa, that's a great question. You know, I think that we could probably spend a, a whole hour <laughs> uh, or a couple of hours talking about challenges, which are many. And, and you're absolutely right. I've talked about, the, the bright side, I've talked about the opportunities, I've not really delved into the challenges. I think challenges you know, are, to me, there are sort of the business challenges, which is about uh, getting the uh, reimbursement codes and getting regulatory approval and all of these things. 
but to me i would say the biggest thing that i think about in terms of challenges ultimately is being able to get people to use these technologies i mean getting physicians on board to use these technologies and then being able to implement it and deploy it at scale so that the maximum number of people can benefit and doing it in a way that benefits all populations so the responsibility for us as ai scientists is really to think about ways in which we're developing tools that are going to be explainable and interpretable for physicians and how that uh these tools can then be developed uh deployed and implemented at scale so that they can have the maximum possible impact so uh these are the two things that sort of keep me up at night that i think about a great deal there are other challenges the business case has to be there you know how um how do the companies that are developing these tools how are they going to make money uh because the you know not to be too cynical but yeah. the truth yeah. is yes to have impact you're going to have to make money somebody's going to have mm-hmm. to make money so how do you make money so there are a number of other challenges like that but implementation is what i think about quite a bit and and i do think about interpretability because you want the physicians to have confidence in the tools to be able to want to use it thank you thank you so much dr madhubushi it was wonderful Absolutely. talking to you and learning so much about ai we wish you all the best thank you thank you very much Cheers. Bye. Bye.